Hello and welcome back to the CSS Podcast. Today we are wrapping up season five. We're just going to wing this one. We're going to go through some of the episodes that we uh, released this season, talk about some of our favorite little tips and tricks and notes, and really just keep it cash. So welcome to this little wrap up finale of season five. Can you believe it? I can't. Uh, this is awesome, though. I love that we've been doing it this long. I love cash. I'm like, that could be someone's name. You could just name your kid Cash, you know, just cash. super casual. There's Cash is like a name, but Cash yeah, is like- Yeah, that's real popular right now too. Is it? Oh, nice. It's a cool one. Everyone cash, wants Cash. Legend. <laughs> oh, Legend is one? Yeah. yeah. Sick. I don't know like a short name for that. You'd be call him Jind. Ledge. Ledge. <laughs> popular in the blockchain, the ledger. So, so speaking of legend, legendary, there's been some legendary features oh, that have smooth. shipped recently. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start with your favorites? Or I could just go through all the episodes and um, we can talk about it that way. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, they're kind of all legendary. Some of these are just out of control. So yeah, let's start at the top from the start of season five. Just just go. All right. So the first episode that we dove into was all about popovers and dialogues and specifically the benefits of both and disambiguating when you would use each. So uh, these are two really useful APIs that help you build modal or even non-modal things that um, can live in the top layer. And we also talked about top layer in this uh, episode too. We did. And the next one was all about animating it. But yeah, we still see, I still feel like there's confusion in, in my own work between choosing something modal and non-modal. And then, you know, why dialogue can appear non-modally and popover is always non-modal. And I'm like, this can be confusing to pick which one of them. And same with animating it, you know, putting those styles in there can feel like arcane magic. You're like, what are these weird looking selectors and these weird at rules that empower all this? And well, now that we have it, it's in there. It's kind of old news. Copy, paste that stuff and just go. Yeah. I, I think my general rule of thumb is if you want to inert the rest of the page, if you want to force your user into an interaction, then you want to use a dialogue because dialogue will do that. It will be open through JavaScript. That's also one of the differences with modal dialogues versus something like popover. Um, and that way you essentially are saying the user must interact with this element before you return focus or interact with the rest of the page again. So that's something that kind of differentiates those things for me, where if you want something to open like a menu or even a tooltip potentially that has some additional content, but you don't want to inert the rest of the page, you don't want to steal all the focus and focus trap it, then you want to use a popover. Popover also will do focus management where uh, if you click a button to open that popover, it'll automatically focus you into that. Like the next tab stop will be inside the popover regardless of where it lives on the page, but it won't focus trap where it's not going to do like a cyclical focus because the rest of the page isn't inert. You can still interact with it. So true. Yeah. Sometimes I think about it like synchronous and asynchronous. Like, do you want the interaction to be synchronous? Then you choose something modal. Like you're going to delete something, you know, don't let them float around the UI while there's a pending delete request. You've got to make sure that they handle that immediately and that'd be synchronous. And then you've got these asynchronous things that pop in, uh, they overlay and they're non-blocking and there's plenty of those to, to be used as well. Yeah. And also speaking of like the way that you trigger these things, not yet implemented, but in discussion right now are a few different features. One of them is called invokers, which the uh, current API for that is called command four. Um, this would enable you to invoke things like dialogue in the same declarative way that you can open up popovers with popover target. So you don't even have that DX difference, or you won't soon once this is implemented. Um, you can really make the decision based on the semantics of what the behavior of this element is. So I think that those are really cool, and I hope that we get those quite soon. They are available in Safari and TP, in Chrome Canary, and in Firefox Nightly, so like all the preview versions um, for you to check out, but they're just not shipped yet because there's some discussion around spec finalization and all that good stuff. Yeah, those features remind me of like early Angular or Alpine JS, where you're sort of like adorning an element with these attributes that invoke JavaScript type behavior. Um, they're really cool. I'm kind of surprised, honestly, it took so long for dialogue to get some sort of declarative command to open and close it. But you know what? It's okay. Here we are. Sometimes that happens where you'll ship something and then you'll ship another feature and realize, oh, why don't we have that for the first feature? So when popover shipped, it was just such a better developer experience yeah. to have the declarative opening. So nice. Yeah. And closing, toggling, all those things. 
Yep. All right. So that was popover dialogue. And then we covered animating those things, which has, yeah, we had transition behavior in there, like allowing things to be discreetly animated, starting style, and then the overlay magical sort of transition property where you need that one to be discrete also. So this this transference of your popover or your dialogue into the top layer, that also needs to be discrete. So it's got time to do your transition. Those were tricky. Yeah. These, I do think that this set of features is a little bit tricky. And the rollout of these features is also kind of funny because right now in Chrome, we have these four features, uh, which let you animate things for entry and exit animations. But this just went baseline for um, Safari and Firefox for the entry part of the animations. So you could animate things in more smoothly, but the exit animations aren't baseline yet. So uh, that's still a little bit of a work in progress. Is it exit or is it entry? It was one of the ways. I think it's exit. Yeah, that's not done oh, exit. yet. Exit, sorry. Which is which is kind of okay because like I like it when things close faster than they open. You know, it's like, ooh, give me a nice presentation so I feel connected with it. But when I'm done with it, I'm like, throw it in the trash. I'm like, go away. And it's nice. I mean, maybe closing instantly isn't so bad after all. No, it is the entry effects that are baseline. The exit effects are not yet. And it's because... We have starting style and transition behavior allowed discrete now in baseline. So you can tell the browser how you want something to animate in from display none or into the top layer. Like that's kind of what teaching the browser the starting styles does. And then allow discrete lets you animate previously discrete properties like display none, visibility hidden, even things like blend modes. So instead of initiating on the 0% of the transition, it's, it now will go on the 50% if you apply the allow discrete keyword or property. But what's not baseline yet is animating display none itself for the exit animations and animating the backdrop pseudo element of, with overlay. So overlay is not baseline yet. So you can do the entry <laughs> effects. I saw a demo from Jay using starting style for what looked like a view transition. He had a popover, looked like it came out of a button. And maybe it even was a child of the button, but the starting style had it scaled down. Mm. So that way, when you showed it, it appeared to come from the button. And I was like, this is a really clever use case for starting style. Because it did. It had so much of the view transitions vibe, but without the JavaScript. It's kind of cool. Was it also anchoring? Was it anchored to the button? And I think it, it was also anchored. It? Yeah. Nice. The trifecta. Yes. I love to mix and match these features. They all go so well hand in hand. Who's the DevRel on these, on these features? They, <laughs> they should be high-fived because somebody's making sure it all works together. Yeah. We also had an episode on Anchor that came a little bit later in the season. That was episode 87. But we had a lot of fun with that one, too, because we showed a lot of different examples of how you would use it. We talked through all of the ways to use anchoring. So like the anchor function versus a position anchor. Um, we actually had to re-record this because there were some syntax changes. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm glad we waited on that one because otherwise we would have output the episode and be like, no, oh, but it's OK. Yeah. What are your favorite anchor tips? I love the the most height for the options. Like uh, it's not the fallbacks. What is that one called? It's position. Position try. Position try order. Order, yeah. Position try order. Yeah, I do like that all of them got renamed to position dash something. That seems like a healthy refactor because then I don't have to kind of mix and match these uh, selectors in my head or these properties. I can sure to just like start with position dash and be like, all right, editor, what's the rest here? <laughs> and lean on it. Yeah, but then you get that whole list and you have to find the right one. Yeah, you do have to find the right one. I do love inset area because I'm looking at a lot of my old anchor demos and I was doing a lot of math, you know, trying to calc this, calc that, positioning top to anchor bottom, some really like mind flippy type of um, positioning. And then now we have inset area and it's like, no, just be on the top. Position area. Yeah. Oh, position Speak area. Speak of renames. <laughs> oh, position area. Yeah. So you see, it starts with position. I should have just, oh, yeah. just assumed. What about you? Got a favorite anchor position feature? I think it's really cool that you can mix your own custom like app position try rules with the default auto flipping rules like that is so cool to me. Um, so with position try fallbacks, you could set up your own position try rules where you can have custom positioning, margin, padding, that sort of thing. Um, but then you can also use the browser default ones, which are flip block, flip inline, flip start. And you get all this logic automatically based on the available viewport space to just mirror essentially your your anchored element your positioned element yes. not the anchor the anchor doesn't move <laughs> um so i think that that's one of my favorite things about 
anchor positioning is just like a really powerful functionality written in a really concise way. Yeah. Position visibility, also really cool. You're like, hey, if you go off screen, go ahead and just hide yourself. There's no reason for you to remain displayed. And then it comes back in. You can still see it. Um, uh, there's another feature, too, that I, I don't know if we mentioned it, but it's that you can use the align content and justify content features inside of your containing block with Anchor. I think we did talk about that. Did we? That one's also really cool. I like that these keywords are creeping up in more places, right? Like earlier this year, just a display block element can now place content in the center. Yeah. So if you've got a height set, that you can vertically center without display grid or display flex. And now you can use the same keywords, the same mental model there inside of an anchored element. Right. Super cool stuff. With anchor center, that's the new keyword that you can use along with justification and alignment. Ooh, anchor center. Okay. I might have to go study that one a little bit. Anchor center lets you do things like use the anchor function uh, when you're doing something like bottom anchor top. So you're setting the bottom position at the top of the anchor. So of the positioned element. And then if you want to you know, justify center it, this would be the same as something like position area top, but then you would add justify self anchor dash center and it's that keyword. So you can use that keyword for alignment and justification properties when you're anchoring. Cool. Cool stuff. Well, next is trigonomic functions and wow, that was a fun episode. <laughs> I still think about that one and the stuff we built. That was like a nice tips and tricks episode. Also a long one. We went through a lot of different uh, trigonometric functions and how you might use them in UI. Yeah, that was good because it kind of grounded what these things can do because otherwise they look so intimidating. And I need to go back through. I had that demo I made where I built some physics with trig functions and I should make the demo cooler because I just barely got it working. It's like, oh, it works. There's physics looking springy stuff happening. And then I'm like, all right, time to do something else. But it could totally be something cooler. I'd have to go check it out more. Yeah, I think for me, one of my favorite tips and tricks, very much a trick slash hack, uh, came from Jane Ori, who has this really great post on combining tan and atan2 functions in CSS yeah. to extract values from ranges in CSS. So in the post, she talked about how fundamentally tan with a tan2 inside of it. So if you imagine the tan function, a tan2 within it, it's just a scalar between two dimensions. So in the article, she showed you how you can use only CSS to get the exact width and height of the viewport for like an aspect ratio based styling, if you want, uh, using that equation of like tan and then a tan2. 100 VW comma 1 PX. So you get like the inverse of 100 VW and 1 PX. You pass it into tan, which returns an integer like 400. So if the viewport was 400 pixels, then you get like a absolute value, which is also super useful for calculating things. Yep. Like I, I was just mind blown. And then somebody else brought this up at CSS Day also, this little hack. So cool. Oh, you know, another thing about Anchor we didn't cut. Well, maybe we covered it, but it's like anchored things can be anchored to other anchored things. Yeah. And that's just that's just cool. That's just cool. That, that is cool. That is cool. You could have a whole anchor train. Yeah. Oh, and then anchor size, right? So then you can like offset yourself appropriately. And oh, it's just, it's amazing. There's that API is just crazy. so much to explore with anchor. We're just scratching the surface. And trigonometric functions too. Yeah. Do you have a favorite trig function tip, trick, or hack? I mean, there's two that sort of I keep coming back to that uh, are really handy. One of them is using, it's not log, oh, but it's for typography. And so you get this like really nice curve in your typography in there. Oh, what is the I'll is it to... exponent? It's not exponent. I don't think it was cosine. Oh, well, anyway, it's this like really simple demo where it's just got one of those functions in there. And then each different font size has a multiplier and mm, okay. it goes in there and just creates yeah, yeah, this yeah. really nice scale. The other one that I really like and come back to all the time is using uh, cosine, but you shift cosine half over. So that way it creates, you only want half of the bell curve that cosine can do. And you get this really nice arc from something that starts low and goes to high. That one's also really cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. And it's also good for things like natural movement, like springy effects. Those are good for the... Physics. This is physics. <laughs> yeah, a ton of, well, and I keep thinking too. It's like anchor. You could use cosine and and angles to figure out how to point your arrow directly to the center or to the corner of the element that it's anchored to. You could definitely find a really cool way to sort of like draw a clip path that's very relevant to the directionality of something it's attached to. There's got to be something cool there. Yeah. Our next episode after that one was all about uh, what's new in color and color functions. So that was episode 82. 
And there was definitely some updates to talk about. Yeah, what were those? I don't even remember them. I remember one of them was a, a new function, Light Dark. So we talked oh, about yeah. Light Dark. That one rules. That one's awesome. Essentially, it gives you the ability to toggle between two color values based on the color scheme property. So you don't have to have two different places that you are writing your color rules for your light and dark themes with media queries. You could use light dark in one place where you have all of your rules and it'll toggle between them. Yeah, it's super nice. I can't wait to convert It is a little more, limited, though, because it's that. limited to color. Yeah, it's just color. It's cool. Yeah, it would be cool if you could use it for other things, like a border width or a shadow or something like that. Yeah, but you or gotta... a background image. Like on my personal site, I have different background images based on the color theme. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There was gamut mapping versus gamut clipping in there. Okay, I remember that. Yeah, all the browsers are now using gamut mapping, which is going to make your sort of attempts to to bake in accessibility into the lightness channel of OKLCH a little bit more reliable. So we lost a little bit of chroma, chromacity in some of the colors, but I think it's a worthy sacrifice because uh, we can still reach those colors. They're just uh, not as easy, which is fine. Yeah. Um, another one we talked about here was contrast color, uh, which is one still, not, yeah. <laughs> still not shipped. That one is so tough. And now we have relative color syntax, which again can like use the L channel of OK's LCH to subtract 60% or 60 out of 100. And you're, you'll get yourself almost always into a healthy contrast ratio. But I still don't think that's necessarily good enough. I think that the, the way that that function was headed was really, really handy to just hand that off yeah. to the browser and always have it be right. So not some estimate or some math that's like usually close. Uh, this would have always been right. I mean, it really came from the convenience that like Compass had in the SAS days where you could have the contrast color or color contrast was a function there to have black or white on a background based on the contrast. Like that was so convenient. I wish we had something like that. Hmm, yeah. I wish we did. Hmm. Somebody should get on that and try to push it through. <laughs> I spent lots of time trying to do that. <laughs> I'm sure I'll pick it back up again one day because it's just so valuable. I'd love to see it. Yeah. All right, and then we had has tips and tricks. Oh, geez, this has is awesome. Although has also made this performance on my site recently heavily degrade. So beware, everybody. This can be a, a selector that you do need to be aware of in terms of performance. Mm, yeah, the bigger the DOM, the bigger the problems too with has. Yep, and yeah, it just depends on, you really got to scope those down so that the browser doesn't have to query everything trying to figure out what the matches are. Yeah. But that's, that's tough, that's tough stuff. One of the examples that we gave, I'm just going to give talk about a few of the tips and tricks because I love this episode. I like using has for quantity queries. I think that that's a really great use case for has where you could query the number of children that a parent has and then apply styling based on that. So that can be really useful for grids or for honestly, a number of things if you want to change layout based on children. And um, I have a couple of demos. Adam has like a little bento box layout demo too uh, that uses quantity queries. You could add and subtract it. It's just really dynamic. Like I love this feature. Yeah, I agree. It looked good in portrait or landscape with a container query. That was like a cool trick in that one. Plus using has to count the items and always have a nice little bento or not a bento if it was like an even number of items. Yeah, That's what's cool too is you, you're in control there. You don't have to just kind of give up to the layout engine, um, you can be highly articulate about how these things work. It's really cool. Uh, and then games, of course, has. Has is just unlocking tons of games. I'm surprised there honestly hasn't been a larger explosion of games because of the way that has can query any check mark, any radio, yeah. any sort of input, and then feed that into something else and create state. And that's really cool stuff. I remember I used to, I still have a collection of CSS games and I used to build CSS games and had a lot of fun with that, but it was very much like check mark hacking where you're looking for a certain specific order of things that are checked. And uh, it was just, it's just so much easier to do that now with has. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, much more logical. Debugging that too is like trying to debug PHP or JavaScript without having a console log or breakpoints. You know, you're just, yeah. just writing code and then refreshing and seeing if it works. Another one of the examples that uh, we talked about on this episode was filtering using has with tags. So I have this on my personal blog. I actually need to check the performance of this, but I don't think that it would cause performance issues because it's all the DOM is already on the page. I took it out of mine. Really? Yeah, because okay. it was, was like visual. I could see it. I would like click it and then it wouldn't. Uh, it took a few a few moments for it to render. And I was like, hey, what the heck? And because it kind of makes sense. Like if you do a JavaScript, 
you can just be like, these items display none. And the browser's like, poof, they're displaying none. Yeah. You know? And then uh, if you're like, okay, here, here's a new selector state. And it goes, oh, crap, I have to look at the entire world and try to decide who to hide and who not to. And you're like, I guess JavaScript is really good at this job. You can start with display block, though, and then you could do it the reverse way where you display none. Yeah, you could. Maybe I need to refactor that. <laughs> it's still fun. I mean, it could just be the, like they need scoped or something. Because, yeah, the really the most harmful thing here is, right, is when people kind of use this at the HTML root level and try to like hoist up some selector up to right, the top right. root and then go target some other branch. But, yeah, maybe, maybe they'll solve that one right. day, too. So those are sort of the best practices for has in terms of performances. Scope it as tightly as you can and minimize the size of the DOM tree that has will affect. Yep. If you can. Yep. If you can. The rules. The rules of the game. It doesn't seem to affect initial paint. It's mostly reflows and repaints that you'll see it. Yeah, that's that's very true. Um, well, if you're not using it on the root element on initial load. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. here we go. Let's go right. I mean, I think that's on one of my tasks is to go create destructive has yeah, use cases. This. So there's a good one. Stash it. Uh, so the next episode we talked about was text wrap. So we got into typography. And there's some nice features. This is a pretty short episode, but we talked about text wrap balance and pretty and no wrap and stable and wrap, <laughs> all those things. I use these all the time. They're like one of my favorites when I'm laying something out because it just always makes the typography layout nice. The headlines, the paragraphs without orphans, it's really good stuff. Yeah, we've been noticing more and more use of text wrap balance also. And text are pretty in the wild, especially with balance for headlines. Mm -hmm. I think bigger sites are using that as a progressive enhancement. You know, it's a nice to have little additional feature. It doesn't require a lot of JavaScript math to be able to balance those headlines, which is otherwise very heavy. So I would recommend anyone implement this if you want balanced headlines. Totally agree. Yeah, I think that's why it's become such a staple in my tool belt is I'm like, oh, it's just one line and it looks so good. And if it doesn't work, who cares? Yeah, just add it to your reset. H1, H2, H3. <laughs> yep. Okay, then we did linear. Oh, that's another one I use all the time, um, especially because the open props ones are just an easy import away. And then I have bounces and springs. I just used the bounce today um, where I hovered on, a, hovered on a box and I used springy to push the box up to reveal something underneath the box. And then when you mouse out, it bounces down. So it looks like it hits the ground where you know, because you could visually see where it was. Anyway, these are just so fun and so cool. They bring so much little bits of life for very little impact on my code. Really love these ones. Yeah, so with linear, it lets you essentially approximate curves and springs and other things. Ooh, that was cool. Curves and springs and other things <laughs> by letting you just have multiple linear connections on a graph and the limit is endless. You could have as many as you want. And I remember during this episode, I was curious about if there are performance issues, if you have many, many more. So I looked into it and not really, uh, there's not really any <laughs> performance issues. Browser could just chew through all those points. It's like, no big deal, I got this. Yeah, I checked in with Jake after the episode. I was like, hey, so if you have a really, really big linear easing function, like does that slow down performance? And I think that he like, queried it and didn't really see any performance slowdown. So that was pretty cool. That is cool. Oh, the nesting one was next. And I remember right after we shipped it, another nesting update came out. Oh, so this makes it right now is a really good time to share that. Okay. So in nesting, when you open up a selector and you write some styles at the top, and then you nest some selectors and nest some styles, but then let's say you write some more styles underneath that, that aren't nested. So you had, you had styles in your selector, some nesting, and then you had styles again, which is really common in like SAS files and stuff like that, where you just kind of continue writing your styles. And maybe even you wanted some overrides or something to happen. Well, what used to happen is we used to hoist those styles that were underneath the nested ones up with the other ones that were unnested. But that's not the case anymore. We're currently exploring, and, and we even had it implemented in Canary for a while, a resurgence of at nest, except they would use at nest for you. And so it would take those items at the bottom and put them in another scope just so, or not a scope, but another selector just so that they didn't hoist. They basically, they're trying to get rid of this potential foot gun where they're the worried people are going to not know that the hoisting is happening with those mm -hmm. sort of loose styles at the bottom um, and just making them work as if they should have always worked that way. So that work is still undergoing, but keep your eye out for that. Uh, if that's ever bit you before, it could be resolved. Yeah, that's that's a good update. I mean, mostly this episode was also a very short one where we talked about the relaxed syntax for nesting, where you don't need the ampersand any 
more for bare HTML elements. So if you're nesting something like ULLI, you don't need the ampersand anymore. Yeah, it's Yay. cool. <laughs> it does. It looks good in your styles too. It like feels good to write it. Uh, it looks good. Yeah, that one's great. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about Anchor. State queries was next. I like the state. So you know what too is we were just talking about anchor state queries, which aren't really a thing, but what we're no, trying they're, to... they're not a thing yet. They're not spec, but we want them. But we want them. So just in this umbrella term of state queries, what we want is access to... So we were just talking earlier about anchor can flip automatically bec- between like block start, block end, or inline start or inline end, but you don't ever get to know which one it choose, uh, chooses. And so you can't really place your little down arrow or place your up arrow to match it. And we were like, well, what if we used anchor state queries? And you could say anchor state position area block start and inside of there you could change your arrow to match the way that this was anchored into another element that that could be really cool that was one of the original state queries that we wanted to ship as a way to especially when you had to name all of your anchor positions you'd be able to hook into that anchor position so if you had a position try dash dash top then you'd be able to set up an anchor position query possibly to hook into top and you would know what that is because you defined it and then be able to add additional customization because right now they're pretty limited to what you can do inside the position try blocks but that's not what this episode was about no this was about about scroll state queries yeah (laughs) although i mean state queries that's the thing i just think it's going to continue to grow and i just wanted to inspire folks out there to be like, ooh, what other kind of state is happening that we don't have access to that would be cool to have instead of a state query? Yeah. Do you want to give a quick overview on the current scroll state queries that are being prototyped? Yeah. So there's snapped, overflowing, and is in view. The only one that currently works is snapped. And so you can query a container, which has to be the snap child itself. You can query to see if this element is snapped or not. Hopefully, eventually we get something like colon snapped, but for now we're going to have this state query and it unlocks all sorts of cool non-JavaScript related interactions for exposing what this snapped item sort of state gets to be represented as. Uh, The overflowing ones are going to be cool also to know, like, do I need to put a shadow on the top and the bottom? Is this container even, you know, scrollable? The, again, state that we didn't have access to before. And then even though we have scroll driven animations with the view function, which is pretty much what we're going to talk about in a couple moments here, because Bramus came on and told us all about those. So even though there's view, it would still be nice to have a state query for, am I just in view or not? Something that's a little bit more binary about the state of view intersecting with a scroll port. But yeah, those are the current ones that are in there and can uh, hit me up. I got demos. I think there were demos in the show notes for that one too, but that's been really fun to to try out. Can people play with them? Yeah. Oh, the other one was sticky. Yeah, they can. They can try them in Canary, turn on the web experiments flag and they should start working. And then we also have sticky. So yeah, it can query if something is stuck or not and then adjust children inside of that stuck element to represent that state. I think that one's going to get used a lot. Yes, for sure. That's That was one of the main use cases for state queries is sticky. It's sticky. Uh, then we had Brahmas on the show for oh, the next two episodes. Long time coming. It was awesome. It was awesome. If you liked having Brahmas on the show, give give him a shout and we'll try to convince him to come back on. No, I think he had a good time. <laughs> I think he did too. Everything flowed so nice. I was like, we should do this more often. Yeah. So first we talked about view transitions. View transitions, if you're not familiar, are an awesome feature that lets you create visual transitions between pages or even within pages or within components of pages. Really great feature. I also think because it's a progressively enhanceable feature. Sure is. Yep. You can kind of like add a little zhuzh to your current existing experience. And we're seeing this being adopted more and more. Yeah, I watched... Uh... Oh, let me find their name. I suck at names so bad. Caleb Porzio, right? Is that the name? Is that the name? Yes. Just gave a talk at Laracon showing off their brand new Flux UI library for um, Laravel. And their entire slides used view transitions. And I could see it. I could see. Nice. I Well, honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest here. I could see a flaw in it in that the aspect ratios when they changed between different blocks did the classic thing. So view transitions does this thing where if you're transitioning between two things that have different aspect ratios, one of them usually kind of scales up and gets all ghosty and kind of strange. And you have to target these things using the view transition selectors, whether it's the group or the old and the new, and you can squish them together. And that way, as they're transitioning, the one that would have kind of overgrown squishes down to match the new one. And it's much more seamless. You get a little bit of like some squishy text effects, but it's always so fast and no one knows. I also knew this because I fixed it in my own slides. I'm going to be speaking next week 
And I was like just getting annoyed by it, especially in my headlines. You have a really big text and then you transition to another large headline and there's usually some sort of aspect ratio issue. But if you ask me for the snippet on Twitter, I'll send it to you so you can correct that behavior. But yes, these are really cool. You can see them infecting people's minds with the way that they build. It's really nice. And it is so simple in concept to get started with. It's just delightful. Yeah. So what is the snippet? Is it a long one or is it? It's not long. Let me uh, grab it from my personal website here. Oh, wait, I want to get it from my slides. Yeah. Give me a sec. I'll pull that up. All right. Take your time. But yeah, in this episode, we sort of covered the gamut of how they work. We talked about snapshots. We talked about cross document view transitions and same document view transitions and how those differ, where with same document, you need to apply JavaScript to kind of wrap the interaction to set them up. But with cross document, you know that you have the interaction because you're clicking between pages. So you can just set that up in CSS. And that's like a fun little change where you don't even need to add additional scripting. And then, of course, the CSS that you would need to customize um, and style these animation transitions. Yeah, when I was at Google Connect in China, that was one of my favorite tips is people are like, what are view transitions? And they're like, well, I have a website. It's kind of an old school website. And I was like, here, take this snippet, add view transitions, navigations auto, just put it on your site right now and you'll have cross faded animations. And it'll be great. Like if that's the one thing that you can take and use today without any repercussions, it's that one. Yeah. And that plus prefetching is like Yeah, awesome. speculation rules. Definitely set right. those up too. Those are really nice. Um, okay, I got the snippet here. So it's view transition old, view transition new. So you target some specific element that you want to correct it and you can just set the height to 100%. I think oh, you can also you set go. width to 100%, but that takes that snapshot and squishes it. Yeah, I was going to say, doesn't that like squish it if you have both set to 100%? Yeah. So I chose height 100% on my slides uh, that tested well. Nice. So, okay, last episode, scroll-driven animations. That was Dang. the last episode of the season. Uh, this one, we didn't even go into the tricks with this one. We just kind of gave like a good breakdown, and Bramus does such a good job explaining this. He's done it so many times now, too. You can see he's just like a like a pro in the Olympics. You know, it's like, oh, am I doing backflips over this? He's done this before. Yeah, he's definitely <laughs> done this before, and it, and it showed. It's very slick. Um, but one of the tricks that we didn't get into is how you can just set overflow clip on anything you want. And then any child inside of there can use the view function to see where it's at and intersecting with that clip overflow area. So even though it's not scrollable, overflow clip still becomes an observable viewport for view to use. And this is like cool if you had like an input type slider or an input type range, and you can make that input overflow clip and then the thumb the thumb can use scroll driven animations and the view function to know if it's at the beginning or the end of the mm. slider and drive anything you want, a gradient animation, I all sorts gonna, of things. I was curious how you did that. Yeah. So it was overflow clip. It's overflow okay, clip. Can you describe to our audience like what the demo is that you're thinking of right now? Yes. Okay. So it's really common when you have an input type range that you want like it to look like it's filling up with goo behind the thumb that you're dragging. So if it's at zero, the track looks kind of empty. If you pull it all the way to the right, the track looks like full of water, for example. And that can be really tricky to have a background gradient or just something, some sort of element that's following the position of the thumb and then being perfectly in the middle of the thumbs so that it's like hidden and disguised, uh, but it looks like it's filling up. So the way that I did that is I had a gradient as the track fill and you have a color in the beginning or a gradient in the beginning. And then you have a color stop hint, which I really love these things, set to the value of view. So you're going to use the view transition view to give that transition hint a value. So that way, wherever the thumb is, the middle of the gradient, so the one that to the left of the gradient is going to be the fill, to the right is going to be the empty track state. And if they pull the thumb all the way to the right, the gradient pretty much goes all the way to the right. And you can look filled, pull to the left, you get the other side of the gradient. So it's kind of like cutting a gradient in half. Yeah. And then using the thumb position to drive the color stop so that it's always I uh, love these gradient up. hacks. <laughs> yeah, gradients are crazy. Uh, same thing with masks. Now that I know gradients so well, I'm like masking stuff like a oh, pro yeah. all the time. It's really fun. I think one of my biggest takeaways from, well, what I hope people get out of this episode, but also when I was learning about scroll driven animations was the difference between scroll timeline and view timeline. Yeah, it's like, tricky. To me, when I was first learning, I, I feel like I saw them together all the time. I didn't know which one to use. But scroll, they're very different. Scroll timeline is essentially the timeline of the full length of the scroller that you're referring to. So that could be the entire 
page. So like the viewport height, possibly if you're looking at the entire body, yeah. it could be a sub scroller within a page, but it, it would be the 0% position at the top of the scroll and 100% at the bottom of the scroll where view timeline looks at the individual element and its progress through the scroll port. Yeah. So what's really neat is with this one, you can apply animations to multiple elements in your page. So we gave the example of like animating all of your images in, and then you could apply to like all your image elements of view timeline where it might animate from like the 0% mark. And we also talked about cover versus contain, like different ways to set up the animation. You can go from like contain 0% to 25% and have it animate in at the bottom quarter of your page with opacity, whatever you want to do there. But that would be view timelines. I think that's an important distinction to learn when you're learning these concepts. 100%. Yeah. And they each have their own use cases that are super duper valuable. And so it's funny, we record that episode. I went home that night and updated my website with two new view scroll driven animations and refined one of my other ones uh, because of what I learned just hearing Bramus recap things. Um, yeah. And I, I actually like got a much better understanding of it too during that recording. Yeah, it was awesome. And the one of the ones I did, I thought it was kind of cool was uh, so if you visit one of my posts that have comments coming from Blue Sky or Mastodon, those now animate in from 0% to 15% at the bottom of the page. And just the home page also animates those cards in from the bottom. It's very subtle, so it shouldn't feel ah. very extreme. Nice. Okay, you're seeing it. I did two things in there that I've never done before, and I'm about to do it with all my scroll-driven animations. So here, you're hearing some hot tips from Adam right and this now. This is with cover, or is it start? It's on cover, yeah. The two tips are, so almost... Every single one of my scroll-driven animations up to this point have been linear easing because I wanted this straight connection between the element and the animation so that they felt very connected. But if you stare at that and those are using yeah. ease in and ease in allows them to be a little less jarring as they settle to the final position. It to me was the first time ease in was useful. I'm not kidding right now. I think ease in is one of the junkiest easings that I've ever seen because it's always like starts fast and then bumps its head. And I'm like, that's not easing yeah. in. I mean, I guess it eased. But in this case, it worked out so nice. So that was one tip is ease in on presenting your elements is actually kind of softer and smoother. The second tip that I did was I set transform perspective or perspective origin, one of those two. Anyway, I set it to the top instead of the center because these things are coming in from the bottom. I actually want them to animate more from the top of their origin instead of the center. Mm -hmm. And it gave them a little bit more approachability as they came into the viewport. And it was just like two subtle things that I was like, that made a really big difference to the vibe of these scroll animations. Yeah, sometimes it's those little big things. There's just some good pro tips. I like that. The other thing too we didn't cover in the episode was um, I remember the first time I realized that the view timelines could create natural staggering. Uh, I'm sure there's someone could come up with a way cooler word for this, but basically let's say you have a ULLI and there's five list items and each list item you say, hey, I want you to fade in when you enter the bottom of the scroll port. Well, the thing is, is as you scroll down, or as well, as you scroll these list items into view, the first list item is going to start its animation before the next one, which starts before the next one, which starts before the next one. And you get this beautiful stagger effect for free because that's just how they're individually entering the scroll port. So I love staggered animations and I realized that view transitions can, or no, well, yep. view scroll driven animations can do this for me naturally. So just some really cool features. I have a little thing like that on my blog where um, I have a list of items, like a list of links around the web. And because they're so close to each other, you can really see the stagger where they animate in from oh, the left. Oh, I see it right now. And, yep, around yeah, the web. Yeah, the opacity kind of animates in where it's just like a nice little progressive enhancement, like the little stagger effect. And that's just from using scroll driven animations. Yeah, that is cool stuff. Very nice. There's one more I want to add to my page. Uh, it's like there's like a clock that tells you how long the uh, blog post is. And I really want the time hand to like spin as you scroll. Yeah. It'd just be dumb, yeah, but it'd be like, cool. Yeah. yeah. I'll get that done one you day. You can also take the length of the post or the amount of words and set the clock duration. Ooh, yeah. Have it, have it move on the clock. Anyway, scroll driven animation so rad. And they're also yeah. really hackable. We've seen a lot of really interesting tricks with these because. Uh, again, you can create any sort of clipped scroll port and then observe something inside of it. And so Kaizu has fit width text using it 
because as soon as it grows, so he has like a scale animation on it, and as soon as it grows outside of the scroll port, he stops the animation. And so these things scale themselves up naturally to fit the width. It's really cool stuff. So many cool hacks. So many cool hacks. I want to see more. Anyway, uh, we definitely went over time for what we had planned initially for this episode, but there's just <laughs> so much to talk about. And now we're at the season five wrap up in which we talk about <laughs> some inception. That is all that I wanted to cover. I mean, we went through everything. So anything else that you want to chat about? No, this has been so fun. Thanks y'all for listening. We really appreciate that you you show up to these, that you comment, that you're watching the videos. Even if your comment on YouTube is, hey, there's nothing to see. That's true. And we're sorry. We tried episodes where you saw stuff and it was exponentially more work. And yeah. we're sorry that we're busy doing other things than creating videos. We're just doing our best. We're doing our we're best. Try- we're doing our best. We don't have time <laughs> to do all the best. things. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for joining us, especially shout out to folks who have been joining us for many seasons now. This has been a lot of fun to put together. And uh, I thought this season was just as fun as ever. Just as fun as ever. And next year, what are we going to be talking about? Ooh, it's going to be fun. <laughs> I have a couple ideas. Sick. But if you want to find us online, you can always tweet us. Of course, with the hashtag CSS podcast. Hashtag CSS podcast. We need like a little <laughs> jingle for the end. Um, you can find me online. I'm at Yuna. That's at U-N-A. And I'm at Argyle Inc. A-R-G-Y-L-E-I-N-K or my site, nerdy.dev. Nice and socially connected indie site. Yeah, definitely check it out because a lot of the sort of new features that we talk about are in full effect on that site. So <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> try it out in the latest canary. For better or worse. <laughs> for the best experience. <laughs> Well, your questions could help a lot of people or even inspire a new season. Ooh, do you, yeah. who's going to inspire the next season of the CSS podcast? And if you build stuff with any of these features, like we'd love to see it. So just share that with us. If you know someone who would like the show, share it with them. It's all about sharing and caring. The web is about connections, about links. And that's how people discover the show. So that's our, our ask for you. Just share it. Share it with your friends. Share it with your foes <laughs> share with the world <laughs> Take and leave this. a review yeah. <laughs> if you have a chance on whatever podcast app you're using awesome we love y'all and we'll see you in the next season bye